what better example of the web of life is there than the mycelial network? The Earth is the original gift economy. She's always giving it and always knows how much we need. I envision that from here to five years, we will all have access to nature-based solutions. It's like a big Christmas tree down there that's flashing at us and going, hey, we're talking to each other. We're trying to make this thing work, you guys. Come on. Forget copying biology using mechanical engineering. Let's use biology. Let's work great right with biology. And that led to Ecubative and using mycelium to like literally grow objects whole cloth. Fungi are coming to the rescue again. Here they are. We just have to notice and we have to watch them starting to work with mushrooms. They're just such a blank canvas for a chef like me that gets, you know, super nerdy about this kind of stuff. Well, if you care about plants, it turns out you have to care about fungi. Suddenly you're appreciating things in a different way. And it's not just fuel for your body, but it's fuel for your soul as well. This body is meant to be joyfully energetic. This heart is meant to be loving and compassionate. This mind is meant to access creativity. And this consciousness being infinite is lighter than a feather. The idea is to know how to use it in a very sacred way that it creates an underlying embracing of wanting to be free. There's something very uniquely powerful about these experiences because they seem to confront the existential mystery of what this whole project of life is about. Mushrooms have unique chemistry. They have Hey, so, whoops. <clears throat> Are you guys going to cue me that come on or? I'll just see it. Hey, welcome everybody from around the planet. We are a truly connected family gathered to celebrate the wisdom of nature's intelligence as seen through the portal of the mycelial network. 
We want people to share the wisdom that's below the ground, above the ground, the model of how nutrients and information are shared without greed for ecosystems to flourish. I believe that to truly be nature's operating instructions. So it's an honor to host and help bring together these incredible top experts of fungi and share their stories with all of you. So please send your questions in the chat box and let us know where you're from and we'll try to get to as many as we can. We had so many people come from all over the world yesterday, Scotland, Switzerland, Chile. It was great to see the fact that we are truly a global network. We're going to engage in the live panels and we're going to unveil the mysteries of the fungal network so we can go on this journey of discovery together to make the invisible visible without any preconceived ideas, but with a curious mind and an open heart. Between the panels, we're going to play Nature's Wonders, and some of it is already being used in healthcare to treat anxiety, depression, and addiction. So please explore the mushrooms. These are rooms where you can go in and get mushed on art, on cooking, on education, foraging, and psychedelics, and engage with the mushroom heroes we've recorded, the voices from the underground. I'm overjoyed to introduce our panelists, courageous leaders and friends who have broken barriers to explore the healing energy of solutions we need for a sustainable future. And our panel today, we're gonna to dig deep into mushrooms for mental health, a healthy body and a healthy planet. So my guests are William Padilla Brown, Malin Ussinger and Adam Ghazali. William has had the opportunity to growing up traveling around the world, living in England, Taiwan, Mexico, New York, and in his hometown of New Cumberland, Pennsylvania. He's a social entrepreneur, citizen scientist, mycologist, amateur psychologist, urban shaman, poet, and the father to his beloved three-year-old son, Leo. Malin is a doctor in integrative medicine and the co-founder and the director of integrative medicine at USONA Institute a nonprofit medical research organization focused on developing and testing psilocybin and other psychedelic compounds as agents of health and well-being. She's also the director of integrative practices at Promega, a global life sciences company. And over the years, we've paired up on several occasions to create stunning visual meditations using my imagery and her spoken words. Adam is a dear friend and a fellow photographer, lover of nature, and is an American neuroscientist, author, entrepreneur, and inventor. Um, Adam is the inventor of the first video game approved by the FDA as a medical treatment. He is a board of trustee member, science council member, and fellow of the California Academy of Sciences. So, Will, I wanna start with you. I want to tell me, how did you become such an expert in mycology? And I was curious, did you study that in college? No. Nah. <laughs> um, <laughs> trial and error, um, using the internet as a, as a means of uh, discovering information. Um, you know, I grew up on the internet, so Googling things was second nature to me. Uh, and... Uh, you know, when I was 16, I dropped out of high school because I felt like it was interfering with my education. And uh, I just went on the fast track to permaculture. Um, and in learning permaculture where I learned it and realizing not as many people in that field of study were versed in mycology in the time that I became interested in it, um, I felt like that was an, a, a good area to explore. So, you know, just using the internet and then playing around, uh, always trying things after I learn uh, reading books, trying things after I read, um, and, uh, you know, just learning from my own mistakes, hanging out with a lot of people like, like these guys. <laughs> yeah. So, so Will, when I first met you, um, you were at this urban farm teaching a mycology class. So tell me, why do you think it's important, especially in the inner city for people to learn about growing mushrooms and perhaps why is it good for your health? Um, well, Mushrooms can be utilized for uh, nourishment. Um, they're a very nourishing food that can help, um, you know, once we're, once we're nourished, we can, you know, activate, utilize our bodies and our minds in different ways. Uh, and that's what I kind of utilized them for at first. Um, and then I realized that 
Mushrooms are incredibly beneficial for uh, alleviation of economic stresses due to the fact that they can be cultivated on uh, urban waste streams like um, coffee grounds, paper products, and uh, living in rural Pennsylvania or outside of rural or around rural Pennsylvania. Um, there's lots of straw and other things like that that were pretty much free. Um, so there's a lot of uh, ways that people in cities can access um, what would be considered waste and turn it into something that is uh, increasing uh, every day, uh, increasing in value uh, as product, um, all the different mushrooms that we can grow. Great. <clears throat> so, um, Malin, I was curious, um, with the work that you're doing at USONA, um, conducting and supporting these, the clinical research to further the understanding of therapeutic effects of psilocybin, focusing on alleviating depression and anxiety for people with whom these current medical treatments fall short. Um, I'm curious, uh, it's such an exciting arena. Where do you see it all going? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, the hope, it, the hope might travel down a, a couple of different rivers, I think, which will ultimately support each other. So this stream that USONA is on, um, taking these medicines, which, as we know, have been used wisely and well by other cultures for thousands of years, but now we're taking them and putting them on this medical track, trying to get FDA approval for a very specific molecular form used for a very specific indication. And um, it's an important river because one of the things that that could do um, in the not so distant future, if these are all approved, you know, carefully studied and show the effects that would suggest they would make good medicines is that mm -hmm then we would take these substances and make them available within medical systems, insurance systems, so that um, it wouldn't be something that one can only get um, legally these days if you're willing to travel to a place, to a retreat center where they are legal, or do the research and find a culture and in a place where they've been used indigenously and um, you could go there to have the wisdom of a shamanic healer or a medicine person guiding you. Um, those options, while really important, and I'm so glad that they exist, they wouldn't serve most people who are still getting their medical care through through a modern system like we have here. So it's, it's important to do that. Um, but I also want to say, as a person who came to medicine and even to modern Western medicine, first through my own holistic lens, that was a lot more like what Will was doing. I want to say, too, it's so important that we continue to look at um, what, how these medicines would land in the medical arena versus the legalization efforts that are coming. And... Um, that you know may well succeed in many states maybe even earlier than some of the FDA rivers so so if they're going to come through more of just a, a straight citizen approach what i hope can be true from that is that we can learn about the way communities need to come together to make healing not just a solo venture. You know, it's um, when communities come round to listen to each other's stories, to gather and support through community-wide efforts, healing goes differently. Um, in fact, what even is considered an illness is quite different. And so I guess my hope would be that as we go forward, you know, I think we'll think we'll be taking the best of what each of us on this panel can maybe be bringing to it. So understanding through this rigorous, double blinded, controlled pathway with the FDA, what is safe and effective about these medicines and what are dangers that we need to be aware of? Are there any for people with certain kinds of conditions where we would really want to be careful of giving them psilocybin? Um, so that's an important track, but also understanding community use, um, community-based models of 
wellness and support to add in. And then as I understand it, and I'm looking forward to hearing Adam speaking about this more, but we have so many more intervening variables to understand even on the medical clinical side. You know, what, what really constitutes best set and setting? What kind of therapy should be given before and after? Who needs what kinds of individual supports to be safer and have a better and longer course of benefit with these things? So anyway, one day I, I hope they will be in the medical system, but I hope our, our studies will really be able to operate also with these social and cultural learnings and the tweaking of our understanding of what works medically. So big dreams. That's my well, hope. Or, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That was a great overview for a lot of the conversations we've been having regarding the legalization, regarding, you know, the, the legal practices, the healthcare practices. So I, I think that was a great, great setup for me asking Adam, you know, Adam, you know, so often we think of medicine that it has to be something like molecular, like a pill we have to take. <clears throat> And I'm curious because I know you're interested in taking imagery and even video games to develop cognition. What is your vision for combining video technology for set and setting with psilocybin? Yeah, well, thanks, Louis. It's great to be having this discussion with you and our other panelists. I, I feel strongly that um, you know we're on an exciting path, as as, as Malin just shared in terms of thinking about psilocybin and other psychedelics as medicine. But we have a long way to go to figure out how we can do so in the most effective way. And that's what I'm really excited to advance along with my team uh, at UCSF. We've, for over a decade, we've been studying um, experiences as medicine, what I think of as experiential medicine. And we've been using technology to deliver that. So with visual imagery, um, other types of sensory stimulation, reward and challenges, and video games are a great way to deliver an experience because they're fun and engaging and people uh, do them for long periods of time. So, and as you mentioned, we've taken now the first video game that uh, I designed and developed with, with our team at UCSF all the way through FDA approval. That's now a medical device to treat inattention in children with ADHD. So the lessons and the insights and methodology that we've applied to that, we think are now applicable to advancing psychedelics and psilocybin is gonna be our first area of research as a personalized medicine that can be precisely targeted. That's really the goal. And the way to do that is not just to adjust the dose, right? Not to just to think of it as a pill. I think of it as molecularly initiated, but it's an experiential medicine in much the same ways that we're doing with video games and other types of sensory stimulation. So how do we both better understand and guide the environment, the context, the experience, the set and setting, all these terms mean very close to the same thing, so that a person has a safer experience and also has a more enduring and beneficial outcome. Because as we know, you can take psilocybin, let's say, and have a bad experience and have a negative outcome. Uh, you could take it and have a great time and have it really positive experience, but one that doesn't actually change you. And you could also take it and have a transformational experience where your life is different, uh, you know, after that. And we know that experiences can induce long lasting changes, right? I mean, PTSD is a negative uh, example of this where you one single experience could detrimentally impact the function of your brain for the rest of your life. What we're trying to do here is like the opposite of PTSD, right? To use such a powerful experience to, to lead to um, meaningful and sustainable benefits. And so that's what we're doing at UCSF. We have a great team, Robin Carter Harris, who I think most of your listeners know is uh, is now director of our division of psychedelics at Neuroscape and Jenny Mitchell, who just recently was the first author on the MAPS trial uh, in nature medicine, showing MDMA benefits for PTSD are both on our team and really excited to have them. And we're going to bring the latest um, methodologies, both from biosensor technology, signal processing, machine learning, neuroscience, to understand 
the state of an individual as they go through a trip treatment and then to be able to push and pull on the levers that are available to us what they see what they hear what they smell and what they feel so that we can have a better experience and then better outcomes so that that's the journey that we're on i love it you know coincidentally we're, we're collaborating with usona at uh, the pacific neuroscience institute in santa monica we were doing a clinical trial to treat patients with alcohol addiction. So we're combining psilocybin with my imagery where as they're coming on to the medicine for the first 40 minutes, they're watching these beautiful rhythms and patterns of nature. And then they do the typical treatment where they lay down. Uh, Daniel Kelly, the neurosurgeon there is like leading that effort. And um, you know, there was a recent study that, that came out. I think Adam, you shared it with me that said that you know, the combination of nature and psychedelics has a synergistic effect, you know. And so I love this idea that if we if we can't take patients outside during a, a treatment, especially a clinical trial, the fact that we can bring the, the healing energy of nature inside the hospital room and, and even actually the built environment, because maybe in the future, we'll be able to walk into your home and your living room and you go, hey, Siri, take me to Tahiti, you know. Take me to Machu Picchu. Take me to a sacred place where I can get this kind of healing energy. So, uh, I, again, I'm opening it up. I think this we're, we're at a precipice where Sorry, all this is I'm happening. Sorry, place. Whoops. <laughs> uh, I, I mentioned Siri and she woke up. Um, I better not do that again. So, um, I, what do you guys think is going to happen in, in the near future? I mean, I love the groundbreaking stuff that you know Adam wants to do. Um, you know, immersive experiences are popping up everywhere. You know, the Van Gogh exhibit is like super popular. People want to go to things like that. Um, you know, and, and obviously in education, an immersive experience is where you learn a lot deeper and retain that information much longer. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts? Um, yeah. I've been uh, thinking a lot more as I've been uh, taking people out into the forest to go foraging over the years, I've been noticing more and more people are out there with their phones in their hand, um, taking pictures and and um, looking through different applications on their phone that can help them to identify uh, plants and mushrooms. Some of them not are not so accurate, but um, definitely moving in a good direction. So I think um, in the near future, there will be more developed augmented reality for um, helping a technologically indoctrinated individuals back into natural settings. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think that will help. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of it is based around mushrooms, as I've mentioned in previous talks, um, I believe that uh, mushrooms are the hooked on phonics of ecological literacy um, in the sense that uh, individuals that go out seeking mushrooms have to uh, discover all sorts of other uh, intricate interrelatedness uh, in the forest systems or whatever other ecosystems they're in uh, in order to find those. So um, increased nature relatedness through um, through technological aids, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Kind of. Hmm. Go ahead, Lynn. Kind of built. Building on that, you know, I, I the way I sort of think of this for myself is like nature, nature's relationship to us and psychedelics can become this kind of virtuous cycle where what you're talking about, um, Louis, the project where you're bringing in nature videos to prime people so they can get more from their psychedelic experience, uh, especially when they can't be outside or in a more directly embedded in nature setting to have their experience. That is a super important end of the cycle. And then taking it to what Will is saying, it's like you come out of that psychedelic medicine experience and you care more about nature. So you want to be out in it. You want to engage in activities that would protect it. And one of the reasons I think that that's so important is in a day and age where we no longer have, you know, one or two or three dominant religions that give people stories and have a way for people to orient their lives and, and feel connected to one another in a bigger picture is that nature is 
that bigger picture, that bigger story that I think can connect people without dogma. It's probably like it's both the least common denominator in terms of nature speaks to everyone and yet you know, uh, a high denominator in that its its value is so incredible to us. And so if psychedelic medicines and nature can become, you know, part of this repeating cycle of increased care of us, increased care of nature, um, it that can only be helpful, right? And I know that that's what so much of the research um, that Robin and Roz Watts and um, Sam Gandy, Leo Roseman, all so many of the people who collaborated um, early on at Imperial began to find this nature relatedness um, through psychedelics. It's just super important. You know, I, I, look, for me, you know, the big takeaway when I made Fantastic Fungi was I knew a lot about bioremediation. I knew a lot about, you know, the fact that it can sequester carbon, but this whole idea that my cellular network being this underground network of connection. And, and since I got two doctors here on the panel, um, one of the things I've recently kind of thought about is the fact that it's, you know, when you're speaking, Melinda, what I was hearing was really it's all about connection, you know, and that's what we're discovering, I think, with nature, because whether it's farmers or doctors, we tend to isolate, sterilize, and poison these things. In other words, you know, soil is critical for plants. Plants make flowers. Flowers become fruits and berries and nuts we need to eat, right? And when we eat them, we absorb the microbiome of all those interactions that are occurring in that food. And that becomes part of our gut, becomes part of our living system. But instead, we, we tend to like, you know, we want to, you know, kill uh, and poison, uh, you know, the, the, the bacteria, the insects, you know, the fungi that we think, whether you're a farmer or a doctor. So every cell in your body, right, can, is speaking to every other cell right? It's all about connection. And so for me, I think this giant takeaway with nature is that it's all about connection. Nothing lives alone. Not even a single cell lives alone. Yeah, yeah I would, it's so true. I mean, just just echo what, what uh, everyone has been saying. You know, nature, nature is a really <clears throat> important part of my life. Uh, Louis, you and I have in common uh, nature photography for, for decades. And I think that there's an amazing opportunity here to combine nature with psychedelic treatments in lots of ways. <clears throat> We've been talking about using technologically delivered immersive experiences during the treatment because it's safe and controlled and can be done in clinical trials. But real world nature <laughs> is uh, obviously critical and that can more easily be introduced before and after treatment, sort of as priming, um, and also for processing and integration, uh, I think that is an amazing potential to lead to better outcomes. So I'm excited about work in, in that regard. And the other, you know, the, the research does show that uh, psychedelic experience of psilocybin uh, can lead to this sense of connectedness with nature. Um, it's a very commonly reported outcome. And you know, many people have these peak or mystical experiences during uh, psychedelic treatments that lead to positive outcomes, but it's not the only place where that occurs. Uh, sometimes it is in the setting of music or in the setting of nature itself. So there's many ways of achieving these sort of transformative changes by experience and bringing them all together is the challenge, but also the opportunity that I'm most excited about. And having that sense of connectivity uh, is, is the ultimate goal, because if we don't feel that, we're not going to feel empathy for each other and for the natural world. And if we don't achieve that, then our entire future on this planet is in danger. Uh, all the policies on climate change will never sustain, especially if our children don't feel that love of nature. And so I feel very strongly that in addition to supporting our mental health, supporting our health with the planet and how we function as one is, is critical for our future. And I think that in this conversation, 
conversation are all those messages that that is the ultimate goal here. I agree. I think one of the one of the exciting things I'm exploring with bringing nature imagery, let's say, into a clinical trial is the fact that I do a lot of um, you know shots of time lapse, slow mo, micro, macro. So I'm not showing you what is out there. So that already kind of breaks the human paradigm of human vision, you know, and you realize that there's a lot beyond the, you know, the, the normal human vision in terms of time and scale. Um, and then I think it develops a deeper appreciation for when you do go outside. You know, when you see that macro shot of the bee pollinating that flower and the, the pollen is shooting all over the place, um, all of a sudden, like, you really get what is going on. And you're not going to run away from that bee. And I think for kids, especially when you learn the beauty of that inner interaction, that intersection between the animal world and the plant world that gives us all the healthy food we need to eat. Not only are we grateful for that, but guess what? It's beautiful. It's really beautiful to watch. So true. So, okay, so a couple of studies have come out recently and you one at Yale that said that they gave psilocybin to mice which sounds like it helped you know with growing I think new neurons you know which is really interesting and another study also came out saying that you know with psilocybin people that are listening to music have a much deeper engagement and appreciation um what are your thoughts about that um as as a as an individual that is more of a consumer and spectator of consumption of psilocybin um and and that's that's the realm of my research with it um i would say uh that the one thing i've noticed in commonality um uh, amongst the experience is that the unique tailoring of the psilocybin experience through individuals neurological pathways oftentimes tends to um, uh, tease the consciousness into the present moment um, where a lot of us are preoccupied in our day to day experiences. Um, I, I see psilocybin as something that really kind of um, removes those preoccupations uh with whatever whether it's a tendency to pick up your phone uh due to um social anxieties uh or um a preoccupation with how much money is in my bank or um what am i doing tomorrow or do i like what's in the refrigerator like there's a lot of things that keeps people preoccupied um but i think that's when the music really starts to sound better when you're actually present and hearing it all instead of having uh, uh, internal chatter also going on. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I, that's the one thing I see as a common um, a common thread because it seems to be so different and variant in the experiences that individuals have through um, the way that they feel or what they see um, or what they hear. Um, but all of those things seem to always bring individuals uh, consciousness into the present moment. Yeah, what I hear in those studies, Louis, and your question is, you know, these days this might not be so surprising to people because of the way this particular scientific understanding has reached us in the popular press. But when I went to medical school in the mid 1990s, it was a pretty new idea that adults could grow new neuronal co connections, that nerves could regrow, that your brain wasn't done developing, your nervous system wasn't de done developing when you hit early adulthood. People prior to that decades earlier just thought you, you had what you had when you were an adult and you were done and if you were injured, you know, too bad for you. So this study about neurogenesis, the growing of, of new neuronal connections is, is really magnificent. And one of the things that I think is exciting to think about influencing is it's like we don't just want those neuronal connections to regrow randomly. The idea that 
we could grow them in directions that are good for us. Good for us as individuals, our individual mental and physical health, but good for us also in terms of building pathways in the brain that lead to greater interrelatedness, uh, greater care, uh, fewer, fewer dividing stories between us. And so it again, it leads back to one of these questions that we already have some answers to and Adam's lab and um, the walks that Will takes people on to look for mushrooms, they can all give us more knowledge about what are the things we can be thinking and doing regularly that train our neurons and our neural circuits to act in certain patterns that are just better for us, that heal the divide within and heal the divide between. So yeah, maybe with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Adam and he can say more about his perspective on this. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Milan. Um, so I, I think that it was really uh, fortuitous that you mentioned those two studies because it, it gets to the core of the mechanism of action of psychedelics and psilocybin in terms of its therapeutic benefits. And um, we're still figuring that out. There's a lot of work to be done. But both of those papers allude to two aspects of it that are not the same, but they relate to one another. So the first is that uh, psilocybin and the data that you mentioned is, is an amazing paper in, in Neuron recently, also showing changes in um, the dendrites, so sort of like the, the receptive parts of, of neurons, like the branches of a tree, that the spines, the buds change dynamically and sustainably with psilocybin this is in, in animal research, uh, looking under a microscope. So that, um, that property of our brain to modify its structure, its chemistry, its function in response to experience and also in response to damage as, as a compensatory mechanism is known as neuroplasticity. And what seems to be uh, true from the research that you alluded to in other studies is that these compounds are uh, pro-plasticity. They increase plasticity in the brain. So they make the brain more susceptible to change, which is fascinating and important and can apply to so many things. So that's, that's part of it, is that these compounds increase plasticity. But <laughs> increased plasticity doesn't have a directionality, right? It means that it's now more susceptible to change. Your brain is in a you know, we, we actually start with a very high level of plasticity when we're born. And although, as Malin mentioned, and my own graduate school work in the 90s was on that very topic, plasticity and aging. And um, we did think that the brain was rather static. But now we know that plasticity continues throughout our lifespan. But it does decrease as we get older. So your most plastic moments, I have a 10, 10 month old daughter, so I get to see it right in front of my eyes, is, is when you're, you're a baby, and then it decreases with age. It seems that psilocybin is increasing that plasticity. But as I said, it doesn't have directionality. So that goes to the other study, is that in addition to these compounds increasing plasticity, they also change our entire perceptual constructs of the world around us, both in time and space and how you view uh, you know, music and other art and nature shifts and how you view yourself, all of those constructs that we make that allow us to understand the world are now malleable again. It's not just the plasticity, it's that the way that we interpret the world has shifted. And that could be good or bad, right? So if you have a very negative experience while on psilocybin and your brain is more plastic, I would say that it would be it would, it would make sense that you would have an increased opportunity to have PTSD. But if you had a very positive experience and had this ability to reform your interpretation of the world and yourself, then it could lead to cures to things like depression and anxiety and addiction um, and could be beneficial for people um, going through the struggles of realizing that their life is going to end soon. So. Those are the two mechanisms that I really focus on. Increased plasticity and also the shift in perception that occurs with high doses of these compounds. And how do we bring those things together to lead to the best outcomes? That's the, that's the opportunity and the challenge at the same time. I love that. Yeah, yeah. 
drawing out on that last point, Adam, just to add one of the most fascinating yet poorly understood things I think that's emerged from these psychedelic uh, medicine studies is that there are some people who have dramatically difficult experiences, just you know, horrifying, scary. They, they feel ground down or that they're, the important elements of their life have just been stripped away from them occasionally when they have a, a psilocybin experience. And yet some of those case studies that have been written up of people with these very difficult experiences who have also had the benefit of excellent preparation and integration. So the psychoeducational work that goes into getting ready for that experience in a trial, good mindful support of people while they're having the dose, and then again, a kind of a psychoeducational, mindfully based supportive um, contact afterwards. There are some case studies of people who not just a couple of days or weeks later, but months later, have an incredible psycho-spiritual opening, if you will, that they attribute back to their psilocybin experience. Now, of course, that's a it's a questionable thing, right, in scientific research, where can you can you really count on that person's story of attributing their change back to that experience? But but for now, it's the it's the best thing that we've got is their narrative saying, I had this really hard experience that left me feeling just empty and terrified. Like I, there's one um, research participant I can think of who was a, a woman with cancer, a single mom with a young son, and um, her psilocybin experience, it was just petrifying to her. She, she saw everything possible about her death and the loss that that would create. But um, some months later, life had just returned to her. Her cancer diagnosis was not different, but her sense of the opportunity of the moment had come alive. So what do we need to better understand and guide, if we can, to help to know what depth of difficulty and duration of difficulty and type of difficulty can an individual handle and what are the factors around them that we can help support to increase the chances that they would get to that opening on the other side where things seem connected and alive again. And I love that. I mean, you just completely described in detail like our entire research program. I mean, exactly. that's it, right? And, and right now that um, what's happening in the brain during these treatments and trips are, you know, it's a black box. We, we don't know. And maybe the best guides and uh, shamans and people that have been doing this their entire lives have insight to what's happening. But for the most part, we don't understand the connection between what we will call the peak experience, sometimes called the mystical experience, that that moment during the trip when everything shifts, good or bad, challenging or flourishing, and then how that leads to change that endures afterwards in a positive way. We don't understand that yet. That's exactly what our goal is, to record physiology and neural activity during the treatment so that we can look inside the black box, understand those events better and in real time and then use that data to help support the person's just a so they don't have a very negative experience and you know challenge is one thing that's fine but you certainly don't want to have it a damaging experience and then and, and ideally you have a, a, a you know an enlightening powerful experience and we think that with that data and then guiding the environment we can lead to the better outcomes but you described perfectly what what our entire uh, goal at neuroscape at ucsf is um that's good uh, Go ahead, Bill. we it, we oftentimes mention set and setting, and um, I just cleaned up the room I was in as yesterday my head wasn't in the best space and the room became a mess. Um, and this is often representative 
and we and I've heard this throughout culture as I've grown up all the time. Like you know, if your space is a mess, it's a representation of your mental state. Um, and I've witnessed in my own experiences and many other experiences that um, when people reach into these mystical states or psychedelic states um, where they'll feel inclined to clean up, um, whether it's cleaning up their home or cleaning up their relationships and things like this, um, to prepare their immediate set and setting, um, which if anybody is savvy with permaculture terms, I would reference as like a zone zero, um, the immediate space around you. Um, and what I started to recognize as my own experiences became more broad and exited my immediate zone is that my set and setting was of uh, one in a culture that did not serve me um, and seemed to be very antibiotic. Um, and, uh, you know, I oftentimes still struggle with this living in central Pennsylvania um, with the with the. Uh, political ideologies and, and uh, lack of diversity and things like that. Um, so uh, especially now with legalization, uh, decriminalization and things like this happening, um, and we all know that beforehand and continuing um, that most of these spirit experiences are going to be happening outside of a professional setting um, is that there's going to be a lot of individuals um, having an experience into a certain setting that is very, uh, maybe very uh, un unsettling. Um, so I, I see how these experiences are driving culture through individuals that have powerful experiences and express those into culture in a way that is digestible and translatable to um, massive amounts of people. Um, and understanding that the psychedelic experience translated through that way can be just as powerful for somebody that doesn't consume the substance, but has an experience through uh, some, through somebody else, through community or through culture. Um, so I just think it's important things to note because, I mean, I've witnessed people in my own family and people close to me have uh, terribly dreadful uh, uh, psychotic experiences through substances that have provided me enlightenment and ecstasy um, just due to set and setting, um, you know, growing up through uh, powerful religious ideologies. Um, myself growing up in and out of military bases and um, having such a strict uh, um, uh, mindset on how, uh, as a man, I'm supposed to be or, or, uh, or um, how, how you're supposed to feel and things like that. So I know there's a lot of people coming out of a lot of different um, programming, um, a lot of different cultural programming, societal programming, um, where we're entering the state of plasticity, uh, where we'll be entering into a state of uh, allowing consciousness to meta program program yourself or be susceptible to whatever programming you're sub subjected to um, and this is oftentimes something that i encourage people that are microdosing and going to work to be aware of um, that even though microdoses are such a small scale that you can still enter into that plastic state and if you're going to a job that you're not necessarily uh, happy about and you're doing it to function in a job that you already don't want to be in you might not want to put your brain into a plastic state to be reformed around a place that you don't want to be. Um, so I'll just kind of throw those things out there. Wow. That was That's great pretty comment. amazing. You know, yeah. I, I think it's a miracle <laughs> and that in, in a way that, you know, these substances can bioremediate not only your body, but your perhaps your brain. I mean, how does it know to uncover, let's say, a trauma that's been buried deep inside of you that you're not aware of, you know? How does it know that, you know? Um, I mean, because I've had personal experiences where something has come up in, in a journey that I didn't realize I had suppressed. I remember having this, you know, feeling that when my mom died, I had to sort of take care of all the family and the issues, you know, be the guy in charge and all that. And I, re I realized I never cried. And... And then I cried during that, that moment because I had to kind of hold it in, but I didn't realize that I'd been holding it in for, for a decade or more, you know? And it, I never thought about that, but it came up, came up really in a very powerful way. So I think that I'm just in awe that it can, um, you know, kind of do what decades of psychotherapy would take to immediately go right to the cut to the chase, figure out what's wrong, 
What do I need to tweak? What do I what do I need to uncover? And yes, that can be uncomfortable. And yes, that can be difficult. And I think that's what you were you know talking about, Berlin. And later on, you look back and you go, well, shit. Now that I I realize it, I've looked at it. I can move on, you know. And it's no longer this like splinter in my soul that that you know I, I need to pull it out. And once I pull it out, it's no longer a pain. So um, yeah, I mean that's. That, and so I share also, Will, your feeling of what it's like to grow up where you have with the kind of, you know, confined cultural restraints and and um, racist attitudes. I'm sure it's extraordinarily difficult. And, and a lot of these studies do show that there's more compassion, more kindness with people that have gone, you know, that have had a psychedelic journey. Even people in prison had their studies that show that they're less violent. So... It, it is a, a gift that it does move people into a more kinder space. Uh, yeah. And what is that? Is it called the overview effect? The thing that happens mm-hmm. to astronauts mm-hmm. when they go out yeah. and look down on the earth and you sort of realize there are no borders between countries, you know, like the, this, this idea that we could exist as one becomes so much more real. And I, and it seems like psychedelic medicines can so often do that for people. Um, Will, I can't remember where I saw this, but it might have been in the out in the magazine article and um, outside about you or somewhere, but you use the term social permaculture. And I thought like, wow, I want to hear him talk about that because it, it seems like... Um, it seems like the kind of thing that we need to be doing alongside of clinical trials, you know, to better create the grounds for this medicine to land and be used in a way by people that has a, a better chance of healing. Is that, did I get that term right? Is it social permaculture? That you said? Yeah, um, I started using that term um, during my permaculture design course back in twenty. 20- 14 um because i recognized and my instructors also recognized that the permaculture design system is effective beyond agricultural systems it's a method of biomimicry utilizing natural systems to uh implement those aspects into human systems to increase resiliency um like those natural systems have uh and i started to see ways that um this could be introduced into social settings um, because social settings aren't uniquely human uh, at all. Um, uh, although we are incredibly social creatures and our brains developed around that in a, in a unique way. Um, but it is incredibly important. Um, I recognize also at a younger age that um, a lot of times uh, stories and uh, culture kind of makes a shaman out to be like this um, drug dealer or, de- or deliverer of substance. Um, where in a lot of a lot of cultures, um, I've noticed that they kind of play a role of like a social psychologist or um, a social scientist, where they view the social landscape from that overview perspective. Um, whereas they're the uh, the one that's capable of taking um, that substance in a way, or taking that substance um, enough um, that they can see uh, a different perspective. So. Um, I think it's through those perspectives that we have, you know, people that are able to um, uniquely assess uh, the individuals in the community. Um, and it has to come back to community. Um, there we're, we're living in a time where a lot of people don't know their neighbors um, in the United States. Um, and that's really detrimental to mental health and social settings. And uh, yeah, so all, all of those things tie back to this experience I had um, on on lysergic acid whenever I was around the age of 19. Um, I took a fairly large dose and I had this experience where I was traveling through dimensional space. Uh, I would say about five or six dimensional dimensions I could perceive. And as I came back into my body through space and time, seeing all those perspectives, um, I had this understanding that the only way that I could achieve homeostasis in my biological body was through symbiosis with 
local systems, both biological and social. Um, so that's when I started really focusing on the social because I was like, I already know how to identify the plants and work with the mushrooms and grow the algae and all that kind of stuff. And I can get into nature and figure that out easy. But when I go back to the society, when I go back into the community, there's this friction um, that, that, that needs to be remediated. So um, I found in remediating that it was like very similar to the way that I would clean up my room whenever I was starting to have my first psychedelic experiences or first starting to try cannabis and things like that to fix my immediate set and setting. Um, I started to help to remediate my social set and setting, which, which allows for increased levels of homeostasis, which allows for your, you to do more with your mind. And I hope that, um, I mean, I know, I don't hope, I know that I'm a living example of it as an individual that taught themselves molecular biology while they were high as a high school dropout. I don't really see any other way that I could prove that through working with nature and through working with society in, 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 in holistic ways that you can achieve anything through working with plasticity and intention um, what you do with it, uh, afterwards, um, uh, that, that, that you can do really all, anything. That's amazing. Will. thank you so much for sharing your, your deep, deep experience and feeling it, it, it actually triggered, you know, there's a question that came in that is similar. The question was, you know, large movements towards community, open-mindedness and equality are opposed by hateful groups or even our own government. What can we do as a community to make this upcoming mushroom boom more resilient than the last? I would like to add one more thing before and give my the, the voices over to others. Um, I think that the most important thing that we can do to make this more resilient politically um, and on social settings is to increase our political power through the resilience of nature. Um, I, I sat through so many scientific uh, events, there's so many agricultural events um, where I would see so many beautiful people talking about this amazing work and all of the science that they have behind it to do bioremediation or, or land management. And they're looking for funding, looking for funding. And I'm like, you guys are the most intelligent uh, people associated with the, the nature of uh, the, the, the language of nature. And nature is the base of the, of the economy regardless. And if we can't figure out how to make uh, make wealth out of it, then nobody can. So I know that we have it within us and within our communities to create wealth out of this and create uh, economic power out of this. Um, and social and political power comes with more people being able to live livelihoods that are associated with nature. Um, the more people that are able to take a step away from working in those warehouses that are detrimental to the environment, that are detrimental to our society, that are, end up being detrimental to our mental health. Um, the pe when more people can step away from uh, con consuming, uh, being subjected to being only able to consume in food apartheid situations where there's not options for other foods and things like that. When more of this start stuff starts to spread out and more people are growing food and going into, into, into nature and things like this um, and can afford it and are not paying into that, then there's less political power with those industries able to pay politicians to make policy whenever the businesses are successful are the ones that are farms and and permaculture businesses or or sustainable energy production or sustainable construction um i mean i've been seeing incredible in every realm of industry i've been seeing incredible um not just sustainable because we don't want to sustain this this crap we want to regenerate new build build from the waste uh, uh compost the waste and 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 grow from and grow from there but once once those industries gain gain the power and people are working doing those jobs or not working for the other industries that's when the political power comes that's when the social change starts to happen and we're going to start to witness that because there's more and more people from these younger generations with these ideals that are reaching that age and reaching that um, amount of economic wealth where they're hiring more people um, and gaining that political power yeah i totally well, agree totally agree yeah i think I think what I would say to that, Louis, is I I always think that the most important truths kind of end up landing as paradoxes. You know, they one part of it is true, while another part of it seems is completely opposed to it, but also true. And together, uh, you know, I think we move forward by embracing what's useful from both of those and going forward. So on the one hand, I just feel like... A, a big 
vision of what's possible. You know, the kind of thing that you're iterating will in this, like just ch changing all of our ways of thinking, changing streams of waste into streams of generation, um, taking our stories of thinking we're healing by sterilizing and poisoning, you know, as you said earlier, Louis, and, and figuring out what's healing and whole and worthwhile in living systems and living medicines and all of that. So, so we need these radically retold stories on the one hand. Um, and we also know that sometimes when you have a radically retold story, you scare the crap out of people. Um, a little bit like, you know, what, what may have happened, what did happen in part in the 60s and 70s to get everything shut down. And so I hope that simultaneously, you know, we can continue to do what, on the other hand, are super simplified, somewhat reductionistic clinical trials that have to simplify down the variables. You know, you can only study and modify a few variables at a time. Like just to, for instance, right now in USONA, one of our clinical, our, our clinical trial, uh, we were asked by the FDA, and I understand this ask and can respect it. You know, they said, if we're trying to understand the effect of psilocybin as a medicine, we need to understand how it acts independent of too much psychotherapy around it, a too, too much of a vibrant um, set and setting approach that could interfere with the understanding of what psilocybin does. Well, you know, ultimately, probably, my hunch is that we're going to continue to find that the two have to act together. But for the time being, we're doing this simplified approach in our study that minimizes psychotherapy. It doesn't take away the set and setting and the context approach, but it minimizes it. So anyway, just as an example to say, you also have to be able to speak the language of certain very specific channels and do safe and rigorous approaches that will be understood in those channels to further that line of evidence. But if if you do one without the other, the story will be incomplete, right? We, we have to take the best of these learnings and the best of these approaches and energies and bring them together. So. You know, uh, sometimes it, as an example, you, know, you look at the opposite of, of what you're trying to describe as this grand vision. And um, I couldn't help but think of the fact that like Bayer owns Monsanto. Monsanto makes Roundup. Roundup kills the soil. But, but then Bayer also owns all these giant pharmaceutical companies that, you know, prescribe the medicines to treat the people that have been poisoned by the toxic chemicals we put into our food supply. So... I think what Will is saying, what I'm hearing is the, the greatest power we have is the power of choice as consumers, you know, that we move away from that. You go to your, you know, your local, you know, organic farmer's market, you support the people that are doing things differently, that are doing things holistically. Um, it's that, that's the power that we all have. You know, we can all have a pollinator friendly garden. We can all grow a couple of vegetables in your backyard. We can all do these things to teach our children. Where does your food come from? So I just wanted to be able to, to kind of add, add that in. Uh, another question I want to throw out really quickly was, has psilocybin studies been initiated to help patients with traumatic brain injury? Now, one thing I do know is that at, at PNI, they're looking maybe at doing a clinical trial with, of using psilocybin to treat stroke victims, I think immediately after a stroke this idea that it could help um, someone who who had that type of, of, of injury. And I can imagine now, like, you know, um, ambulances carrying a dose of psilocybin rushing to a patient and who had a stroke to immediately administer it before more damage is kicked in. So um, anyways, any thoughts on that from my experts about how, you know, studies have been regarding traumatic brain injury or any kind of brain injury with the use of psilocybin 
as a treatment? Not yet, but exactly as you said, it's got to be an, an area of really intense near future exploration. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know, Adam. What What do you know about what you say? I, I haven't heard about TBI studies, um, but right. you know the the bigger picture is that any uh, clinical condition where a change in brain networks and function would lead to a better outcome, there's at least a hypothesis that there could be a benefit here, enough to certainly do a study. And so that includes these, you know, sort of entrenched conditions of the mind that we've been talking about that a lot of research has already been done on and a lot more needs to be done. Depression, PTSD, addiction, end of life treatment, but then there's also the damage that a brain could be uh, inflicted with from all other sorts of trauma, like traumatic brain injury, a stroke, and plasticity is already part of how a, a brain responds to those injuries to heal itself. You could facilitate that with a combination of the psychedelic and also the experiential elements that allow it to heal in the best way. I, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that all of those research studies will be um, underway in the, within this next decade. So, hope, sure. you know, stay tuned. All exactly. right. Exactly. Also, Will, you, you're such an inspiration, I think, for someone who's like, you know, took the initiative, became, you know, a self-taught mycologist. I also know that you're perhaps one of the world's leading experts on how to grow cordyceps. So I just wanted to shift for a brief moment about how, you know, for example, cordyceps is good for the body. You know, there's only like 5% of the species of fungi have even been identified in the world. Who knows how many are out there uh, and how many of them have healing powers. So um, talk to us a little bit about your expertise in cordyceps and what, is, what do you think they actually help with our health as well? Well, um... Cordyceps mushrooms uh, are entomopathogenic, um, entomo meaning insect, and because they associate with insects and consume insects through interesting ways in their life cycles while they're alive, um, they produce a myriad of uh, interesting compounds to um, disturb those insects uh, and, and manipulate them. Um, and those compounds may be detrimental to insects, but a lot of them um, may be very interesting in the mammalian system um, or medicinal. Um, so uh, with the cordyceps, I grow cordyceps militaris, it produces cordycepin, um, which is uh, a, a nandamide base. Uh, it's uh, uh, similar to ATP. Um, so it can provide us energy in a similar fashion. It also produces a lot of nucleobases. Um, I find them to be like very like uh, molecular type mushrooms with an inclination towards uh, humans in a way um, with cordyceps mushrooms uh, they um, kind of aid in helping um, de uh, pre protect our DNA from mutation um, even from just like things simple things like smoking cigarettes or or just being exposed to the, the environment we are exposed to um, things that can in uh, induce mutations um, but then it also uh, has aphrodisiac uh, um, effects. So I think it's interesting in the way that it helps heal our DNA, helps um, uh, uh, synthesize DNA, um, and then encourages uh, uh, us to, to share it, our DNA. Um, uh, so I think that's interesting. Um, there's also research showing that uh, cordycepin and cordymin, another novel compound from cordyceps, can uh, um, uh, inhibit HIV-1 reverse transcriptase, which I believe deserves a lot more research. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that whole group of fungi, I mean, cordyceps is associated with the hypocreals, also including um, the ergot that produces LSA. Um, so they, the ways that these organisms that parasitize like plants and, and, and uh, um, insects produce those compounds to do those things in those plants and insects um, seems to be very interesting when we consume them. So um, that's my understanding, and I'm out here looking for more cordyceps. I was just out in Puerto Rico looking for a rare species, and um, you know, every ch every chance I get, I want to catalog more data on all the unique uh, um, molecular interactions that that nature has provided us. Wow, that's great! Really great. 
Uh, a question for the panelists uh, that came from our audience. What books or guides do you recommend to self-teach what mushrooms are best for and, what, and for what ailments? And maybe is there any website, internet that people can go to to learn more as, as a maybe an initial portal to get more information? I know maps.org Start. would be one. Maps.org yeah. is one. Uh, Lynn, do you, do you have any other suggestions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, actually, one that I was also <clears throat> thinking of in addition to Will's writings and, and so on, but um, you had on Dr. Maya yesterday, and she also has mm -hmm. on her website a whole mushroom section with, with nicely digestible tips about mushrooms and so on. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Those so that, that's be... Dr. Maya Chitreet. For those mm -hmm. who are listening, you can Google her, uh, and that's a great website with rich, beautiful information. Yeah. Um, Paul Stamets, also, whom you I know you work closely with, he, he and his group have published a great deal on if you go to their, their um, commercial site, you can learn about their products. They have nice, um, some really nice descriptions of the the beginning aspects of why they think these species are healing yeah. and for what. Um, and then just, you know, go to PubMed and, you know, type in turkey tail mushroom and you'll get all kinds of interesting stuff. Some published by Paul and his group and others, but, or just type in mushrooms and the immune system, mushrooms and cancer. And you just, you know, you can get the abstracts on a bunch of these things yeah. and they're right there. That's one of my first go-tos. I would, uh, I'd recommend the uh, fungal pharmacy by Robert Rogers. It's a great book. Uh, that has just a whole list of all different um, medical research on different mushrooms. And then he also has the book, uh, The Human Clinical Trials. Uh, so the fungal pharmacy focuses on like all different trials that include, you know, research on pigs and, and mice, but the Human Clinical Trials book is focused on specifically on mushroom research done on humans, mostly in Asia. Great. Well, um, I think we've uh, come close to our conclusion here. I, I just want to thank everybody here. I hope that, you know, everyone's enjoyed the panel and we love exploring, um, you know, further with all of you. As a matter of fact, if you go in the mushroom huts, you can uh, dive into a topic of your choice that do a deeper dive and play those clips and bounce around the mushroom huts. I think that would be a a fun thing to do this weekend if you want to dig deeper and also you'll know that the, all of those recordings with people like adam and and will um they are longer conversations on the voices of the underground and uh i encourage everyone just to you know stay tuned uh at 10 o'clock there's a great panel on psychedelics and documentaries i interviewed uh, good friends of mine that did Have a Good Trip, one of the most popular films on Netflix about a comedy documentary about psychedelics. And also at 11 o'clock, um, there's a great panel and, you know, leading conversation by myself talking about healing with, with music and visual imagery and mushrooms. So scroll down to the bottom. You'll see them on your page. Um, thank you, everyone. And I thank my panelists today and yesterday. Um, very grateful for the work that you guys do, the vision that you share. Um, may the sports be with you. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, everyone. What better example of the web of life is there than the mycelial network? The earth is the original gift economy. She's always giving it and always knows how much we need. I envision that from here to five years, we will all have access to nature-based solutions. It's like a big Christmas tree down there that's flashing at us and going, hey, we're talking to each other. We're trying to make this thing work, you guys, come on. Forget copying biology using mechanical engineering. Let's use biology. Let's work great right with biology. And that led to Ecubative and using mycelium to like literally grow objects whole cloth. The fungi are coming to the rescue again. Here they are. We just have to notice and we have to watch them. Starting to work 
with mushrooms. They're just such a blank canvas for a chef like me that gets, you know, super nerdy about this kind of stuff. Well, if you care about plants, it turns out you have to care about fungi. Suddenly you're appreciating things in a different way. And it's not just fuel for your body, but it's fuel for your soul as well. This body is meant to be joyfully energetic. This heart is meant to be loving and compassionate. This mind is meant to access creativity. And this consciousness being infinite is lighter than a feather. The idea is to know how to use it in a very sacred way that it creates an underlying embracing of wanting to be free. There's something very uniquely powerful about these experiences because they seem to confront the existential mystery of what this whole project of life is about. Mushrooms have unique chemistry. They have compounds in them not found elsewhere in nature. And if you're looking for new drugs, that would be an obvious place to look. Our connection to soil is also our connection to ancestors and helps us to really, I think, understand the cycle of life. The entire kingdom of fungi, which is now estimated to perhaps be three and a half million species, has over 125 trillion different genes. They are the intelligence of the planet genetically. I know that mushrooms are very resilient and have a lot to teach us as a lot of them have been holding their forms for millions of years through multiple extinction events. This could be critical to the survival of our species. If you knew that every breath you took could save hundreds of lives into the future, had you walked down this path of knowledge, wouldn't you run down that path of knowledge as fast as you could?